Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Things We Said Today, where we talk about the Beatles in every which way, but but uh, uncensored. Well, uh, this is because uh, we just go wherever we want to go and talk whatever we want to talk about. I'm Steve Marinucci, Beatles Examiner, and uh, let me first introduce my three cohorts on the other end of the country. First, the host of Every Little Thing, Mr. Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. Hey, Steve. Hi, everybody. And from Beetle Fan Magazine, one of two, one of our two representatives from Beetle Fan Magazine, uh, veteran writer and longtime music fan, Al Sussman. Hi, Steve. Hello there, everybody. Well, I'm just having fun here, guys. Yeah, I mean, you know. sure. Yeah, yeah. And... Last but certainly not least, Beatles author and insider and musicologist and all around nice guy way out there in Maine, <laughs> um, Mr. Alan Cozen. Hey, Alan. Steve. Hey, Steve. How are you doing? Hello, everyone. And we won't even we won't even get on his case for not being a Red Sox fan. <laughs> 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 Any. <laughs> Anyway, this week we're gonna we're gonna talk about several things. The first thing we want to just uh, throw aside uh, a couple of recent things that have happened. Um, first thing is the actually today last uh, well last couple of days uh, Paul McCartney has announced some new concerts. He announced uh, Toronto a couple of days ago. He announced Columbus today. This is Monday the twenty fourth. And there's a newspaper report, although he hasn't announced it yet, that he's going to Detroit which actually was kind of announced ahead of time by the uh, arena last night in a Twitter post. And then there's also rumors that he's going to do Buffalo, though there's no announcement on that. Anybody want to comment about uh, the um, revitalization, I guess you can call it, of the tour? Well, basically, it's like the tour, the, like what Dylan does, what they, what they call the unending tour. It's, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're not even changing the name. It's still out there. And uh, it just, uh, it just goes on and on, you know, which is, which is fine. Hey, as long as he's enjoying himself. I have a question about all of this for you guys. How do you all feel about this way of announcing tours, you know, not too far or not tours, but tour dates you know instead of announcing the whole tour at the beginning which most people do even you know, dylan does um and mccartney always did and ringo always did but mccartney now is announcing them like two or three days at a time and and i know that you know when we had rick here he uh, i think that that threw his game a little bit because he likes to plan where he's going mm-hmm. and you know yeah. follow being a fan on the run um does do any of you feel that doing it this way makes it more exciting, which I, I presume is why he's doing it? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't either. Yeah, it just I, I, no, I, I, I don't like it either. I can't. In fact, I can't stand it for several reasons. It seems weirdly uh, gimmicky to me, you know. It's actually a good idea publicity-wise mm-hmm. because every few days his name is out in, in the press because he's added a new date. So it keeps his name out there. And I think that's a good reason why he does it. He also probably doesn't know his schedule that well in advance. He's always got projects that he's working on Mm. that he's aware of. So he works around it. Plus, as we've heard many times, you know, he spends a lot of time or he tries to. He's so much a family man that he still wants to work his family into his life, especially with Beatrice. He tries to work around a schedule like that. So he may not know when he has a long block of time put aside that he can set aside for a tour. Oh, I, so I, I don't, I don't think, I don't think he plausible. knows. I, really? I, I, yeah, I don't, you I don't, know, when you, you I book stadiums and you book halls, you, you know, you, you can't book those things like two, you know, two months yeah. in advance. Yeah. And, you know, these right. things are all, you know, the, the music business is, is, worked out so far ahead now that um and especially for big shows of this kind you know uh i i don't really buy it i mean it's it it's a semi-plausible theory but i, I kind of think he knows he's just sort of dribbling them out oh well, I, so many I, times I, I, you hear about reports where it's almost like 
you know, a date is almost finalized. They're still trying to work out the details. So it could very well be that some of these dates that are announced aren't really, you know, they really are last minute when you hear about them. I, I think it all comes down to money. I think he's trying to get as much money as he can. And I personally think this whole thing sucks on a number of levels. Number one, for the fans who don't get, who especially, you know, find a show, for example, look at these late, these shows being announced now, you know, they'll be, uh, you know, they'll, they'll pick and choose to go to a show and then all of a sudden find a show closer to them. Mm, right. right. That, no. And that's the pits. Mm. That's really not taking the fans in, into consideration at all. And the, and you know, the whole idea about the publicity thing, I mean, it does, you know, you do get buzz. I mean, I, I you know, a lot of it is, you know, artificial buzz because you get people saying, well, I know he's coming here and they don't know he's coming here. Mm. And they, you know, guessing he's coming here. You know, that kind of, I mean, that kind of stuff. If he, if he's living on that kind of publicity, if he, if he thinks that kind of buzz is helping him, I really don't think so. You know, I mean, I, I, what Alan said about, you know, tours in advance, uh, I mean, you get, you know, you get people, nobody, who else does it this way? You too doesn't do it this way. Dylan doesn't do it this way. I mean, you know, I, I think this is really the pits. And I really, you know, I mean, not from the standpoint, not just from the standpoint of, you know, personal standpoint, from having to try and rush around and, and write two and, th- and three stories you know, in a day, which I've done because he's announced two, you know, a couple of more than one concert in, in a day. You know, it's just I think it's lousy. I really, really do. And Paul, hmm. if you're listening, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. But, I would have thought well, that, you know, from your standpoint, Steve, that you would actually like it because you'd have that much more to write about. On a... um, well, I mean, they they, you know, despite what people, you know, kind of intimate, there's not a lot of word coming out in advance. You know, there are a couple people that kind of know, but there isn't a lot of I mean, they're not telling anybody really and especially now in the case of the internet once something is known it's known period there's no holding it back right so you know but i i do think in in terms of the fan, i think the people who suffer most on this are the fans absolutely mm-hmm. i mean it's not so much it's not so much me you know having to write about it more than once i mean that you know you just do it you just do that yeah. but it's the it's the fans trying to plan their lives and it ends up, and some of these some of these shows ends up end up costing them a lot more than they need to, and and not oh, yeah. everybody has that you know has that much money. Yeah. And I think that's really mm-hmm. kind of that's really kind of I I don't want to use I I don't know if I want to use the word inconsiderate, but that's kind of what I'm leaning towards. It really is. Um, I don't know. I I agree to some to some extent, but in many ways I don't. I do not under any circumstances think that Paul is doing this for the money. He does not need the money. He's doing this because he likes to go out there and entertain and please people. And there are so many people around the world who would love to see him, who have never seen him before live, and, and as well as the fans who would see him many, many times over. You know, maybe not as many as Rick Glover, <laughs> but there are a lot of them out there that, that wouldn't mind seeing him 5, 10, 15, 20 times. And he's going out there, and he doesn't have to do this at his age. You know, he certainly he certainly earned the right to just coast for the rest of his life and not do anything. But mm-hmm. by the same token, I also think that it it really it, it does make things very difficult if you're trying to plan seeing him because, like for example, this past year he played in Philadelphia, and you know Rick was there and Al, you were mm-hmm. there, and um, you know when that was announced, obviously I'm thinking to myself, is he going to play any closer? Right. Will there be any New York dates? Yeah. How do you plan this? Do you mm-hmm. take a chance and buy a ticket now, and then all of a sudden he's playing in New York? And you don't know. But um, in the case of this year and also when he played in Albany last year, it turned out to be, you know, <laughs> it worked out for my benefit because mm-hmm. he didn't play any closer. But you never know when when, uh, when he might add another date. But I also know, and, and it has been reported, that he does try to play a lot of cities that he hasn't played before or cities that he hasn't played in a long time. And he does make a very concerted effort to do that, as well as hitting the biggest areas. 
If he doesn't play in New York City, he plays somewhere close to New York City. And um, But I, I do think you're being somewhat unfair, Steve, because I don't think he's doing this at all for the money. Well, I, what, I'm, you know. what I'm saying is he's, they're, they're negotiating deals. That's what's, what's holding these things up. I mean, they're trying to negotiate deals. And, and so, I, yeah, I, 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 I'm sorry. I do think that. I, I do think there is money. I mean, no, he doesn't need the money, but, I mean, he's not taking – he's making sure he's getting the better deal. And, I mean, normally you would think these things would be set up, in, in a, you know, in, a, in, a, in advance uh, like everybody else does. Why is he so different? I, I don't understand. You know, I, I, I would love to hear – and they – but they – you know, of course we won't, you know, why he has to do it this way. I mean, I understand his he's not going to tour that – he's not touring that much anymore. Um, but I, I really think there's – I really think this is not the best way to go. Anybody, uh, Alan, you want to, you want to? Yeah, I have one other thing to say about this, and that's that, um, I mean, no, he doesn't have to do it this way. Um, the, the question, I guess, is really why, what what he thinks is the benefit of doing this way, and I can't really right. see what it is. Um, I mean, you know, it, for someone like you, Steve, who has a column in this, you kind of are bound to cover every time he mm. announces this because that's, you know, partly it's it's the subject you're covering. Yeah. Um, other publications, newspapers, I mean, I, you know, I can tell you an editor, um, if you were to go to him every um, three or four weeks and say Paul McCartney has announced three new dates, he'd sort of, you know, say get out of here, you know. I mm. mean – they would announce a, a major tour, sometimes, not all the time, when the tour is announced. And then only if he hasn't toured in, you know, 10 years or something. Like in 1989, it was a big deal, you know. Mm -hmm. um, since then, I'm not sure that um, at the times, so I'm not sure that we had tour announcements except uh, to the degree that it, it was associated with an album, you know. But there's one other thing, and that's that, uh, you know, Paul is we, – we, we talked about how this is an inconvenience for the fans who, you know, might go to a distant city and then find out they could have gone to one closer. Mm -hmm. um, there's another aspect of that, which is that Paul um, – is supposed to be very, you know, green and ecology conscious, you know, we're eating hamburgers, which makes cows eat grass and do, you know, uh, methane into the air and all, you know, there's this whole thing about um, how me meat eating is un ecological. If you are announcing your schedule in such a way that people are having to travel distances that they don't really have to travel because you're going to be playing closer to them, then you are actually causing an unecological situation in a way. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. But, but I also think, an interesting, uh, you know, I don't think that, I don't think you're going to see Paul uh, announce a tour with a concentrated period of time where he's doing a lot of dates over a month or two months. I don't think that he physically can handle that. It has to be spread out over several days. So I don't know I don't know if he can plan a few months in advance. I don't I don't really know. I think he just wants to he, he's made the comment that he likes to do less shows because you can, As he's doing each one, it makes him hungry to do it again. You can you if can announce still, a, a six month tour with fewer shows in in advance and announce at the beginning sure. all the cities you're going to. Sure, you can. Even if you're Absolutely. only playing twice a month, why mm. not? Absolutely. No, I I agree with that. Yeah, there's no reason. And there's then no especially for what what tickets cost these days, you can you know let people towards the end of the tour save up all that time. See, instead of announcing. So much, so so much closer to the date. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I just think it's some weird publicity thing, and um, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what he thinks he's gaining or what his publicist thinks they're gaining. Um, it, it just seems. I, you know, uh, the only one who thinks that this may even be rational is Ken of the of the four of us. So. Um, I imagine a lot of people out there are sort of scratching their heads and saying, "Why is he doing it this way?" Oh, I'm not denying the inconvenience of it all. Mm -hmm. Okay, but um, I just think at this at this stage in his career, we should be grateful that he's doing anything. Yeah, but you know, you know yeah. and the fact that and the fact that he's doing he, he gives you so much in one show. I understand everything else that you're saying, Alan. 
the inconvenience of it all. At this stage, I just think that anything that we get now from him, and that also includes any recorded music, he doesn't have to do anything for the rest of his career. You know, I'm just, I just feel blessed that he's doing anything at this point. But at the same time, yes, I do see how this, this makes things difficult on the fans. And look, okay, he wants to do fewer shows. Fine, you know, but let's not make it sound like he's, you know, um, you know, getting wheeled out in his wheelchair. And right. The guy gives like a three-hour show when he does it. Yeah. He's got plenty of energy. He's in better shape than all four of us put together, probably. Mm-hmm. Um, True. And uh, yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's a choice for him. I can understand, you know, wanting to do fewer shows, and that isn't even the issue that we're talking about. And and yeah, it's great that he's doing it. Uh, I think I think the only question really is, you know, why not just announce the whole tour all at once? You know. I mean, if you add a show here and there, as sometimes people do, you know, something goes really well and there's an extra day, so you add an extra show. But that's not really what he's doing. He's not doing multiple shows in cities anymore. But we may have belabored this too much. But How far in advance does Dylan announce his uh, – because, you know, he's kind of famed for just nowadays just being on tour all the time. He and... announces about four months of, of concerts at a time. Oh, okay. And he'll do that several months before the first of them. Mm-hmm. And it's great because you can plan your bootleg collecting that way. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> and, and there's one other thing that is an inconvenience on the fans as well, where Paul is concerned, is that every time that he announces a new show, the pre-sale happens like a few days after that. Yeah. So it forces you to make a decision very quickly. Yeah. So I know a lot of fans don't like that either. And that may be a corporate thing more than, more so than even, uh, you know, the uh, uh, the McCartney organization. It might be, <laughs> they may make the call, you know, saying, uh, you know, well, you know, a few days before the pre-sale, you, you can announce that you're playing such and such a show. It's po- yeah, it's possible. I don't know. Yeah, well, and you know, there, there's one there's one other aspect of this that I think is worth bringing up and you guys will probably disagree with me but i think when an artist tours all the time as paul does you know it may not be as special year to year when you hear that he's playing Mm -hmm. so the fewer dates that an artist has there may be more of a demand because you have fewer opportunities to see him so that creates more of a frenzy that way so um you know i know that that Paul, we keep hearing just about every single year, he performs somewhere in the world. And we've been fortunate here in the States that he plays some dates here. You know, mm-hmm. he's been doing that for, for quite a while. Mm-hmm. But um, the less he's in your area, the more you want to see him when he does come. So, you know, maybe there's a little bit of uh, that thought being put into it as well. It's more special if there are less shows. Mm-hmm. And I know you're going to say, well, still announce them all in advance. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but I, I think that might be, you know, part of the reasoning behind this. It's, mm. it's possible because when he played, because uh, this recent English tour was the first one he had done in, I think, as the bus comes, goes through the room, um, that I think that was the first tour he had done in England in at least a couple of years possibly more than that. Mm-hmm. And I, and I know that particularly the Liverpool show was the first time he had actually played in Liverpool. Of course, he's there a lot because of Lippa and, and other things, but, uh, but it was the first concert that he had played in Liverpool in quite some time. So, so that does mm-hmm. kind of make, you know, make it into a special kind of event. I don't know if it's that special when he plays two or, th- or when he, announces two or three shows at a time here well still i i i you know i i think it could be done i mean he, he he's mm. it could be done differently because he's you know he's i mean nobody else does this like this really i can't think of anybody else that does this like this and 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 it's not i don't think it creates more of a demand paul mccartney is not the type of person that needs demand really he's going to get demands no matter you know, where he plays, when he plays. I mean, the, you know, doing the piecemeal thing isn't going to, isn't going to create a bigger demand for him. And if he thinks it does, you know, I don't know what to say, uh, but Mm -hmm. I I don't think that. I I don't know if I agree with you. I don't know if I agree with you. 
I think if, if you go back to a time when he used to do several shows in the same area, like play Madison Square Garden four out of five nights, mm-hmm. I don't think he would do that now. No, I don't know if he would sell out four nights uh, in a week at Madison Square Garden oh, at this point. I, think he, I, I, I don't think... I think he'd sell out. I don't think he'll do it, though, for, for the reason that he doesn't want to tour that much anymore. So... Well, also, he you know he would have to spread the shows out probably over, you know, if he's going to do four shows, he'd have to spread it out over a week because he just can't, he can't bounce back vocally. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I think that's pretty, pretty well documented now. Right. You know, that he's, he right. needs a, a night or even two nights, you know, of not playing to, uh, to really be at something close to full strength. Right. So, well. I think we, we kind of disagree on what the demand might be for him. Mm. You know, it's much safer for him, for him to do one show in an area, even if it's a stadium show, than to do several shows in the same area that are just as big or even four small shows. You know, I think um, if you go back to uh, the way Brian Epstein handled the Beatles when they first came here to in 1964, he didn't want them to play big venues. Right. He wanted to ensure that every show would be a sellout. Yeah. And, um, you know, maybe that instinct is still in Paul now. He wants to make sure that every show that he does is a sellout. And you can't overdo because maybe the demand might not be as great. So there may be some thought to that because, as I said, Paul has been playing in the States on a regular basis Mm -hmm. for for many years now. So it may not be as special from year to year. It's special to us. But I don't know to the general public if it matters as much because they might think, oh, he'll be back next year. Hmm. Yeah. You know? So there may, there may be that thought put behind it, too. Well, I don't know. I, I, I just, yeah, I, I, I have, I, I don't know. I, I don't think, I think we can, we can debate this all, all day long and we're not going to get anywhere. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's interesting that we, that we you know, the, um, the way we talked about it. So, anyway, thank you, uh Thank you, guys. Um, let's move on to. We were going to talk about the George Harrison Dark Horse album. Oh, before that, you were going to follow up on the two items from last week uh, about the young okay. lady. Uh, oh, okay. Um, last week we made. Thank you, uh, Al. Um, we made mention of Pat Niemi Kubaki's illness, and I think the next day she passed away. Mm. And so we want to send out our condolences. To Absolutely. Her Yes, yeah. and I saw there were a lot of comments about her on Facebook a lot, and so uh, she was well known. She was known by a lot of people. So uh, our, again, our condolences to Pat. And uh, how's it, uh, and I've noticed Rick's been posting like crazy. How's he? How's he doing, Al? Have you talked to him? Uh, I haven't talked to him, but he uh, he posted a shot of him noticeably thinner, but out there. Uh, no pun intended. With uh, with Brian Ray, uh, apparently, I guess over the weekend. I saw that, and I wondered. Yeah. And, and a couple of people asked, and I didn't see the follow up. If that had been taken recently, or was that an old I picture? Would, I would think so because he's noticeably thinner. Uh, okay. Rick is, but yeah. uh, but uh, he's um, he's he's keeping a very upbeat uh, upbeat attitude. So yeah, he def he definitely is. It's a inspiration to the rest of yeah. us believe me you no know doubt it, I mean, no, no doubt so. about it although i asked if he uh i did ask him if on on facebook if he had been uh comparing notes with jimmy carter <laughs> yeah they had they, the two of them, the two of them should should get together yeah uh, okay anyway let's talk about uh george harrison dark horse uh, i gotta say that uh as far as george's albums go this is not one of the ones that i you know, I throw out as my as my favorite. I mean, it's good. Um, you know, and I I do tend you know I like George's albums anyway, but this one came kind of around the time of the tour, and it starts off with the um, the Harry's on tour uh, instrumental, and for that reason, it's eh, you know it start it kind of brings reminders of the tour. It does have Ding Dong Ding Dong, which I absolutely adore. And Dark Horse and Far East Man, which Ron Wood later did a great version of. Um, but uh, as far as this album goes, it's just not, as far as I'm concerned, one of his better albums. 
Any any of you guys want to say anything about this? Well, who wants to start? <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll I'll start. He's it's it's an album that has some some excellent songs on it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the problem problem is that George's voice is obviously not up to par in much on much of the album uh, because of all of the uh, uh, rehearsing he was doing for the uh, you know the Dark Horse tour uh, mm-hmm. at, at, toward the end of '74 and um, possibly another injury that he might have had to his uh, to his larynx. Uh, but the songs actually are, uh, by and large, are, are pretty good. Uh, I do like Harry's on tour quite a bit. So uh, so sad, which had been released almost exactly a year before uh, mm-hmm. George's version uh, by uh, Alvin Lee and Mylon mm. Fever. I had always liked that version, but uh, I thought that George's uh, version actually topped it. Uh-huh. Um, Ding dong, ding dong is absolutely is a is a, a great song and one of the few I guess you would call it you know New Year's uh, New Year's rock songs. Bye bye love though that uh, rather strange version of the Everly Brothers uh, debut hit uh, with uh, participation by the at that point the former Patty Harrison and Eric Clapton. I just thought. I, I've always felt from just from the time it was released is just weird. Mm-hmm. It's very, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's an inside joke or, or what, but it just didn't, you know, it just doesn't come off as, uh, as all that much of a joke, but a far East man, uh, is another, is another excellent song. Oh, by and large, uh, it's probably, it has some, it has some very good songs, it's just that George's execution of them vocally is uh, less than great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, who wants to go next? Ken? Al? Alan? I can go next. If... Okay, go ahead, Ken. Overall, I like this album a lot. And the thing is, I don't try to make comparisons to all of George's albums because you know, when, we had, um, when we had Darren DeVivo on here, I think he said that George to him was the most consistently strong of the four Beatles in their solo careers. And I would tend to agree with him. There's very little from George's solo career in general that I don't care for. I agree with a lot of what Al had to say about the execution of the songs. I like the arrangements of the songs on here. And I think the songs for the most part are really strong. I love Harry's on tour. And that song was done deliberately to be the song to kick off on the road, sure, right. his concerts. And it fits perfectly. It's very catchy. I love the guitar work. Um, I love the LA Express on there. It's just arranged really well. It's just a great opening cut. And um, So Sad, I definitely think, is one of his best solo songs. Mm-hmm. I love the 12-string guitar work that he does on it. And... I love the way the song ends with the guitar, very similar in a way to, to Here Comes the Sun. The, mm-hmm. the, the melody of So Sad is just absolutely beautiful. Mm-hmm. And the phrasing of George vocally, which is something I think we never really talk about. Most people don't really talk about with the four Beatles as their gift for how they phrase when they sing songs. He's so unique in the way he does that on many of the songs throughout his solo career. And I love the way he's, he sings, even if his voice is hoarse on some of the songs. And to tell you the truth, you know, if you weren't told that his voice was hoarse, you may not think that way. I mean, I don't really hear, there are certain songs where I think his vocals are absolutely fine. Maya Love, I think mm-hmm. his vocals are really just great. And that's one standout track really on the album. It's a very funky track. And I love the, mm-hmm. the, uh, the piano work from Billy Preston on that one. Simply Shady is a song that I love a lot. I love the melody behind it. Uh, Bye Bye Love, uh, unlike you, Al, I really like that version. Really? Because it's <clears throat> it's a very different arrangement of that song. And I like when an artist takes a chance and doesn't just copy the original. I'm sure there's a lot of people who might prefer if George just tried to do it the way the Everly Brothers did. But I also know that George has a, you know, a warped sense of humor about yeah. him. Yeah. Where, um, you know, he's poking fun 
he's poking fun at the the fact that his marriage had failed. And, you know, you got lyrics in there like, uh, I hope I hope she's happy, old clapper too. We had good rhythm. You know, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I love the fact that he's making fun of the situation. So uh, you might think it's kind of weird, but, you know, that was George. George had a weird sense of humor. When people asked him what did he think of Eric Clapton taking his woman away, he said, I'd rather that she was with him than some jerk or some <laughs> right. idiot. And that's that's the way that he looked at it. So um, it's a very different arrangement of that song. And it's it's an arrangement that only George can do. George has a style that's all his own. And you either really like it or you find it odd and you find it difficult to, to deal with. But I like the fact that he went in a different direction with that song. Um, Ding Dong Ding Dong I like a lot. It's a great seasonal song. There aren't too many that I know of about New Year's, mm-hmm. New Year's Eve. And it, it has taken the place of all Lang Syne for me. But it's, um, you know, I think of it more of a novelty song than anything else, or a seasonal song. And um, just the title track to Dark Horse I love. It's a very unusual song in the way that it's structured. I love the fact that it it starts in with that acoustic Mm -hmm. uh, intro. Um, I love the arrangement of it. Acoustic guitars with a lot of flutes. How many singles have that kind of an arrangement Mm. to it? It's a very different sounding song. Far East Man really has a lot of jazz overtones to it. I remember um, George saying that uh, he envisioned Frank Sinatra doing this right. the same way that um, John thought of Frank Sinatra for Nobody Loves You When You're Down and Out. Um, and Paul was supposedly wrote Suicide for Frank Sinatra. I don't right. see Sinatra singing any of those songs, and, and I certainly don't hear him in any way singing Far East Man. But it's a really interesting song that he co-wrote with, with Ron Wood. And the, the, the real treat for me on this album, apart from So Sad, is It Is He, J. Sri Krishna. Oh, I love yeah. that song to death. Mm. Because it really is, it's, again, acoustic guitars, lots of flutes. It's a lighter version of My Sweet Lord. You know, it's, it's uh, very chant-like, which it is. Mm-hmm. And I love that approach, as only George could do. Nobody else could write a song like that. And, you know, apart from the fact that he's a great songwriter, you could say this about, you know, John and Paul as songwriters and more recently Ringo. They're so unique as writers. Nobody has a style like like each of them. So, you know, who else would write a song like It Is He, J. Sri Krishna? Mm. And um, I love his voice on that. You know, overall, I think the songs are really strong. If it wasn't for the fact that there's a few songs in there where you can detect that his voice is hoarse. Right. It's never really bothered me all that much to begin with. I mean, I look back at a lot of the recordings that I have, especially the All Things Must Pass outtakes, where George is just playing acoustic guitar, and there are times when he's straining vocally. Mm. And I'm used to that. It doesn't bother me. <laughs> Maybe I'm just, because I've, you know, I've heard so much, uh, you know, I know the recordings so well, what they released and a lot of what's unreleased. So um, now overall, I think it's a pretty solid album. There are other albums from George that I think are better, but um, I think that, unfortunately, um, this album, the impression that people have is tied in with the tour, which gets a lot of bad press because of the condition of his vocals then. But one thing that really should be pointed out where Dark Horse is concerned, the album, is that while it it did hit number four on the charts in America, the sales were really hurt by the fact that the album didn't even come out till uh, half the tour was over. Yeah. And that was ridiculous. I mean, talk about bad planning there. The tour started in the beginning of November, and the album didn't even come out till uh, December 7th, I believe, Mm -hmm. in the United States. So here he is playing songs, a few songs anyway, that most people wouldn't even know. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that uh, that was planned so poorly. And it's a shame because I do think that the album deserved better than a number four status. And I think overall it's a pretty darn good album. And like I said, you know, th- there are other ones like All Things Must Pass. It's hard to touch that one. And you know how I feel about living in the material world. Sure. And there's so many other great albums from him. Cloud Nine, 33 and a Third, George Harrison. Those are the top ones for me. But Dark Horse is a, is a pretty solid album overall. There's very little that I would complain about in terms of the quality of the songs. And I do like the production and the arrangements behind them. So mm-hmm. those are my thoughts about what, it. What I was going to, what you were saying just got, got me thinking 
it's it's interesting that Ding Dong Ding Dong never has picked up anywhere near what Wonderful Christmas Time has, you know, has gotten. And I think it's a much better song than Wonderful Christmas Time. Mm-hmm. Um, I absolutely, I, I really do love that song. And it's kind of surprising that Wonderful Christmas Time has gotten gets so much airplay now. And, you know, you either love it or you hate it. I mean, it also, there's a lot of people that hate that. Which I don't understand. I don't understand the hate, the hate, hate thing. That's cool. Well, I think I think that it's because it's just so overplayed now. You know, Maybe, because yeah, that, might, that, these, might be, that might be it. These twenty-four hour, seven day a week Christmas formats that start, you know, Thanksgiving week, and the those the number of songs that are in uh, the the core of those formats. Mm-hmm. Uh, since Wonderful Christmas Time is one of them. It just gets played to death. I mean, you know, you you almost can't walk into a supermarket or a bank or an office anywhere between Thanksgiving and Christmas and not hear "Wonderful Christmas Time." Right. And, right. Uh, um, so. Well, I love that song, and I never get tired of it. Uh, so. Well, I, I don't hear it getting played as much as you say, Al. I think that the airplay for that song has diminished. But, you know, being the fan that I am of the Beatles, and one of one of the many reasons I love them so much is the contrast between the four of them. You can't pick two more different songs than Happy Christmas and Wonderful Christmas Very Time. That's true. And, as far, you know, so that's what's so great about and the, John and Paul. And the weird, the, thing is, between... the weird thing is, is that I've never tired of, of Happy Christmas. I've absolutely never tired. There are, there, I'll have to admit, there have been times... You know, during certain December anniversaries when it's kind of a tough listen, but otherwise mm. when it's, you know, played again within one of those Christmas formats, uh, I still love it. But to be honest, I, if I never heard Wonderful Christmas Time again, I wouldn't miss it. But then also as big a Bruce Springsteen fan as I am, if I never heard his version of Santa Claus is coming to town. I wouldn't miss it because it's just been so overplayed. But uh, but to Steve's point, yeah, it's uh, it is too bad that because it's not really a Christmas song per se, uh, mm. you know, Ding Dong Ding Dong doesn't really <laughs> has has gotten really kind of shut out of that you know holiday airplay. The, it's uh, really for 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 New Year's Day and New Year's Eve. Yeah, it's right. not for like Christmas. You can celebrate for a month before Christmas yeah. or a few months, yeah. but you know who celebrates just New Year's Eve yeah. for a long period of time. So right, right. Alan, yeah. you're awfully quiet out there. Let me see. Uh, among Ken's comments, um, I agreed that um, "It Is He" is a really beautiful song, and um, I actually didn't think any of the rest of you would mention it. Um, and I think that a lot of people overlook it because people got very impatient with the Krishna thing with George. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but you know, it actually, I listened to this album today. I listened to it last week because we were, there was some thought of discussing it last week and, you know, just like to keep it fresh in my, in my ears. And, um, both times that song really just sort of stood out coming at the end of the record and everything. And, you know, it, it, the songs that you guys identified as the better ones, Ding Dong, Ding Dong, and uh, So Sad, or, you know, I agree. I think Bye Bye Love is a mess. I mean, even if um, Patty and Eric Clapton were not on it, it would, it, it, it just is like, what is going on here? Is singing yeah. it weird? And the mm. instruments are sort of all over the place. And it's just kind of strange. But knowing the the personnel on the track, um, you, yeah, it's a, it's a strange thing to do. But, uh, but obviously, if they were all game, um, who are we to say that they shouldn't? If I'm not saying they shouldn't. If, I, I just think the track is a bit of a mess. The album as a whole... I think, um, yeah, I agree. It gets bad press because of the tour. Um, I don't think the singing on the album is nearly as bad as the singing on the tour was. Uh, the, mm-hmm. the, the tour really wrecked his voice. Mm-hmm. I mean, he had gone from singing, you know, maybe one song a night in a half hour set to being the front guy. And um, I think he wasn't prepared for how much of a toll that would take uh, on his voice, mm. you know, a voice that isn't in... Uh, in shape for that kind of thing. But 
when I was listening to Dark Horse, generally speaking, just a general comment about the album and maybe George's albums in general, he has a sound on these records that is unlike anybody else's. It's unlike the sound he had when he sang on Beatles records, even his own songs. Mm-hmm. Um, there is something about his arrangements, the, the, the way the strings sound, the, the use of the slide, the use of um, the, the choices of instruments, the way his voice is. It just sounds like a George record and like nobody else. And you may not like it or you may like it, but it's a very unique thumbprint. And he came up with it, I think, really quickly after the Beatles broke up. And, right. and I think that that's a, it's, it's, it's just an interesting thing, you know, that um, that whatever personality he had as a songwriter within the Beatles, you know, he's, it still sort of fit the Beatles texture and sound. But when he went off on his own, I mean, all things must pass doesn't have the kind of sound that, that I'm talking about. It, it, it's a great album. It's probably his best album. And, and, you know, they're his songs, but I think he hadn't quite developed it yet until maybe living in the material world. And then uh, mm-hmm. on dark horse, it's like full throttle. It's just, uh, it, it's very hard to explain what I mean because it's, it's, it's always hard to capture sound in words, but, um, you know, you listen to ding dong, ding dong, you listen to, um, far East man and, um, uh, it is he, you know, there's just something very, very George accent about every aspect of it, not just his voice. I mean, even if these were just instrumental tracks, you would listen to it and you'd say, yeah, that's, that's a George record, isn't it? You know? Mm -hmm. So that was one thing um, about this album that really struck me that it has that sound. Um, So some songs are better than others. Some performances are better than others. I think it's probably on the lower half of George's albums for me uh, as, as an album. Uh, But it's, you know, it's got plenty of good stuff on it and it has that sound. So that's what I think. Okay. That's very interesting, that one comment you made there, Alan, about even if you didn't hear George's vocals, you would probably know from the backing tracks. And even if you remove slide guitar, yeah. uh-huh. even if you remove the backing tracks, you'd still figure out that it's a George song. Yeah. There is something in the, in his compositions. There's uh, the chords that he uses, the chord progressions that he uses that are unique to him. Mm-hmm. You know, and he, he also, even more so than John and Paul very often uses very odd chords in his songs that somehow fit his songs. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, as I was saying before, John Paul and George's songwriters are so distinctive as songwriters. They have their own styles. And, um, you know, you either love each one of their styles or, or you don't. For you know, And everybody has their own preferences. But And, uh, and, and George, yeah. as, a, as, a, as a guitarist, is... is if you listen to not only the Beatles songs and his solo songs, but if you listen to the songs that he did with other people away from the, you know, away mm-hmm. from Beatles, there's a, you know, there's a very distinctive, you know, you can, you can almost tell, even if you don't know, you know, the, you can, you can figure out that it's George on there. Mm-hmm. Um, very there's some great, there's some, yeah, I, I, you know, I did a, f- a few years ago, I put together some collections of, of, of those, you know, uh, things that he had done, you know, those guest shots he had done on other mm-hmm. uh, uh, album or on other uh, artist records. And they're, they're all, I mean, they're all gorgeous. They're all, you know, there's one with Dwayne Eddy and I can't remember a theme for something, uh, uh, important, really that, important, uh, really important. That is absolutely beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. That's one of my all-time favorite records, and and so, but yeah, I mean, there's there's all of those, all you know, so many of those type of things. But anyway, um, so there's something to be said about an artist being unique, yeah, in every aspect. I mean, when you hear a George Harrison slide guitar solo, you know it's George Harrison, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? And right. that's not something that you can say about every every musician that's out there. No, and it, it's the same thing with John Paul and George. And to a lesser degree, Ringo, as songwriters, 
or also Ringo as a drummer. You know it's right. Ringo. Mm-hmm. Was, you I just gonna, know it's him. I was going to say, as a, as a drummer, yeah, you can definitely tell Ringo. Actually, you know, Paul the same way. Uh, m- more on Beatle records, I think, than, than outside of Beatle records, especially now. But, yeah, you can, you know, uh, that's definitely the case. Um, but, anyway. Um, yeah, the, uh, George is, is, you know, he's a very underrated guitarist. I think mm-hmm. I think the problem is that being as you know personally close as he was to Eric Clapton, I think he tends to kind of be lost in lost in Clapton's shadow. Right. But he's on his own. He was he, he's a, a very very distinctive and uh, you know very very good and versatile guitarist. Mm-hmm. Well, not only that, but uh, we tend to admire the musicians that that do a lot of solos, you know, mm-hmm. and George did solos, but they were usually brief and um, they were absolutely what was necessary on the records. Right. And it's also what he did in terms of rhythm and, and in the backing of of, uh, of his records and Beatle records. But he's not known for being someone that stands there and does a guitar solo right. for three minutes. Yeah. He's not one of those people. And we... We tend to the rock the rock fans tend to look at those people as though they are the greatest musicians, the ones that can improvise the most, mm. as opposed to artists who complement other musicians better. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. So, and the the Beatles were always so good at at complementing each other in every in every aspect. So, you know, if if it would have hurt the record if Ringo had done a solo on a certain song instead of stepping back Mm -hmm. and letting the song speak for itself and the other instrumentation, he would step back. He would know what's right for the record. And Mm -hmm. it's the same thing with with George. You know, I was just talking about, um, I love the song Cheer Down from George. And that's one of the the rare moments when he's playing slide guitar and it's going on and on and on. (laughs) It really doesn't happen, you know, on, on most of George's solo work. (laughs) <laughs> or, or his work with the Beatles to do a he's he's great at a very concise solo. The solo in something is as iconic as you can get, and it's everything that you need in the record. Mm-hmm. You don't need any more than that. Yeah. You know they're very skillful. All four Beatles are at giving you what was necessary for the song, instead of you know everything being about themselves right. individually. So, and that carried over into their solo work. Yeah, right, right. And also okay. one other thing about about okay. Dark Horse is that in that period uh, when we were all a lot younger, there were there were the complaints about the quote unquote preachiness of a lot of George's songs on mm-hmm. particularly on living in on, on living in the material world, and then again on uh, extra texture, and yet mm-hmm. on Dark Horse there's very little of that. You know, there really are very few songs about spiritualism uh, on that album, and and so. Well, you, you've got "It Is It Is yeah, He," sure, and you've, you've got "My Love" on there, right? But it's not being preachy. Oh no, no. I think I think years later we we were able to like go back and listen to those albums and realize that that no, he's, he wasn't being preachy at all. But like I said, we were all a lot younger and. Uh, not as you know knowledgeable then. Mm-hmm. Okay, alrighty, we're gonna we're gonna do something new. We're gonna do a little uh, catch. We're gonna catch everybody by surprise here and see if uh, see what we come up with. We're each gonna ask a question, and um, I guess we'll start with Ken. Um, just because I just because I want to start with Ken. Um, and <laughs> I don't each know of us why, gonna, but <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I'm, I just cause. Um, and and each of us are, are going to ask a question of one other member, and we don't know. We have not been clued in on what these questions are, but um, we're gonna we're gonna just try it and see where we go. So let's start with you, Ken. All right, I will direct this question to Alan. Uh-huh. All right, I'd like you to pick a song from John's solo career where the lyrics are for you the most powerful and have moved you for some reason. 
What what song from John's solo career, lyrically speaking, has touched you or moved you more than any others? Hmm. It may have to be God from the Plastic Ono Band album. Um, it, it's and it's not just the lyrics; it's the delivery and uh, this this whole litany of things that John doesn't believe in and then what he does believe in in the end is you know me Yoko and me it's uh you know it, it's it's maybe a little self indulgence it's maybe a little strange but on the other hand he was um he was fearing feeling very embattled at the time and there's just something about the way he delivers that whole list of names and it, it kind of makes you think, you know, well, wait a minute, you know, there are a lot of things that we take for granted as things that we believe in, you know, including the Beatles, um, which he said he didn't. And uh, it just, I think, makes you think a bit about them, not necessarily, you're not necessarily going to come out and say, oh, I don't believe those things either. Um, it, it just is, uh, I, I just found it a very powerful sort of statement of where he was at that moment. So that would be my answer. Well, that's a, that's a great answer right there, because the, the lyrics there are so powerful, and it tells you where his frame of mind was at that moment. Of course, his mind could change very rapidly, but that's how he felt at that time. Mm -hmm. So, good answer there, Alan. Thank you. Okay, we're going to do one more. Am I, now, am I asking or answering? You're asking. You're asking. Asking, okay. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick Steve, as a matter of fact. Uh-oh, Okay. And I want to find out, when did you first hear the word Beatles, B-E-A-T-L-E-S, not the, not the bug, mm -hmm. the, the word Beatles, and was there music accompanying it, and what did you think? Well, there wasn't music, music accompanying it, I've, and I've, I think I've told the story before, but it was in seventh grade, and I went to a... Um, parochial school in Massachusetts. I was in, I was in Massachusetts at the time. And um, my best friend, who was named Kevin, he, they, they were dividing, the, the class was divided in groups as, you know, as elementary school groups were, I mean, classes were sometimes. And my friend was in a different group than I was, and their group named themselves the Beatles. And I said, and I said to him, and I honestly had no idea of what what this was, uh, and I also don't remember how much ahead of the Ed Sullivan show it was. I'd have to think about what year. I can't remember off the top of my head what year it was. But in any event, they called themselves the Beatles, and I said, "What? Why did you guys call yourselves the Beatles?" And he said, "You haven't heard of the Beatles?" And I said, "No." And he said. Oh, they're this great group out of England now, and and he and that was the first. I, I swear that was the first I had ever heard. Of course, I heard of them quite a bit after that, and as it you know, and I was obviously I was in front of the TV and on the Ed Sullivan show, and I actually, interesting, I did not get to see them when I, they were in Boston. Uh, they played um, Boston Garden and they played Suffolk Downs, mm -hmm. but my father, who was not really a big Beatles fan on the night of the Ed Sullivan show. Uh, he did become a, a Beatles fan somewhat later, got closer to them than all of us did because he was working at the time for a company. He was driving a truck in, um, in Boston. And he said, uh, all of a sudden the police, uh, there was a police uh, motorcade and they put, and they pushed us all over and this limousine drove by and it was the Beatles. And we all, we all yelled at him. What? You got close. You got close to him, but and so that was kind of funny. But um, yeah, that was the way I heard about him. Um, and uh, you know, before the Ed Sullivan show, we went. My mother took us down to my my sister and I took us down to one of the local department stores. I can't even remember what the name of it was. And uh, she picked up the Meet the Beatles album in mono, and I picked up the C the uh, singles with the picture sleeves. So there we go. That's what that's what that's what happened there. Okay. All right. That's about all the time we have for today. God, it really flew, it really flew by today. Um, on behalf of Ken Michaels, Alan Cozen, and Al Sussman, we'd like to say thank you for tuning in. You can catch the show on Podbean.com, on YouTube, 
on iTunes. Um, just do, do a search and we'll be there. Next week, who knows what we're going to talk about. We don't even know. We never know. But that's part of the fun of doing the show. So on behalf of uh, Al, Alan, and Ken, and things we said today, thanks for tuning in, and we will see you next time. Thank you.